So the title of the week's message is Deja Vu. Right? We're going to be talking through the exciting book of Judges. So way, way back in the Old Testament, last week Ian talked about Daniel. It was more kind of towards the middle, towards the end of the Old Testament. I'm going to jump way back before that, back in Judges. But before we do that, I'm going to do, we're going to do a quick history lesson. So we're going to throw up that timeline that Ian used last week. We're going to do kind of a lightning round of history. So up in the top left, we have the beginning, and we go into this section uh, called the children of Abraham. So Abraham was chosen by God. That's the number one thing you need to remember here. He was God's chosen dude. Okay? This is where it starts the entire process going into the Old Testament. The rest of the Old Testament, the entire story that we're going to talk about, starts with Abraham being called by God. Okay? Next most important thing about Abraham, he was a really old guy. That had a child when he was like 100 years old. Okay? Really important there. And he was promised the land of Canaan. Okay? Those are the two main points was he was chosen by God, and he was promised a home, which was the land of Canaan. Okay? He has a son, Isaac. Nothing too super exciting about Isaac other than the fact that his dad tried to kill him. Uh, and then Isaac had Esau and Jacob. So these aren't necessarily on the timeline, but it kind of plays in the whole story. Jacob takes the birthright and the blessing. Jacob has the 12 sons, okay? They become known as the 12 tribes of Israel. So we're building up to this history of this is who the people of Israel are. We talk about the Israelites. It all started with, well, the 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob was eventually renamed by God. He took the name Israel, and that's why you kind of get the 12 tribes of Israel. And then you have Joseph, which I think you guys are all familiar with the stories of being sold into slavery by his brother. He had a coat of many colors. He um, became famous in Egypt. He became kind of a ruler in Egypt. He was second only to Pharaoh, right? Then the whole family moves into Egypt, and they eventually become slaves, right? That leads us right into the story of Moses. You guys are probably familiar with the story of Moses. We have the ten plagues. With the Pharaohs, the final plague is the, the death of Pharaoh's son. The Israelites then come out of slavery through that, right? Then Moses gets the Ten Commandments. The Israelites people are wandering in the desert. They haven't made it to the promised land, but they know that that's where they're going, right? So going back to Abraham, it starts with Abraham. We have the promise. You're going to go to this land. They haven't gotten there yet. We're still at Moses. We've got a lot of cool stories. They're still not quite there. And then after Moses, we have Joshua, the story of the walls of Jericho. You guys remember the stories of the walls of Jericho? They all crumble, you know, yeah, yeah. Okay. But they're finally on the border of the promised land. They're getting ready to enter in. They've, they've, Joshua actually gets them in, and they start to conquer the people, because it's not like just open land. It's not like when people came, the pilgrims came over to the U.S., well, I guess that doesn't really, it's a bad example because the Indians are here, so eh, ignore that example. But anyway, there's a lot of people there. There's people living, there are cities, there's a civilization there, and the Israelites are coming here, and there's promise to them, so they had to go to war and clean out the city. So that's where we're going to open up. We're going to go straight into Deuteronomy, which is actually, so it's during Joshua's time, and we're going to read through kind of the promise that God had, and we're going to kind of build up into where we're going to talk about in Judges. So the next apology is we're going to, we're going to, do a lot, we're going to read through a lot of scripture here at the beginning. So just bear with me. Let's read through. We're going to get the backstory so we can get to the actual application and the lesson that I want you guys to kind of walk away with. Okay? So the first scripture we're going to read is Deuteronomy 7, verses 2 through 5. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess, and dries out before you many nations, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you, and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them, and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them, do not give your daughters to their sons, or take their daughters, or take their daughters from your sons for your sons, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. 
This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols with fire. So this is God's command to them. So they're getting ready to enter. He's like, I've brought you this far. I've done a lot of cool stuff. And this is what you're going to do when you get in there. Sounds kind of dreary. It's kind of a lot of war, a lot of death. This is what God told him to do. But it seems simple, right? It says, the key things here is he talks about God's going to drive them out, right? He's like, I'm not going like, to have you guys go drive them. He's like, but I'm going to do it, right? Let's keep on right there. God's saying, he's not, God's saying, you go do this. I'll go sit over here and watch you do it. It's like, I'm going to do this, okay? He talks about the fact that they were larger and stronger than them. But, the God, but God is going to deliver them. And that kind of, this is where we start when we get into, into Judges. So this is the command. They started to do this. Joshua was kind of known as a little bit of a commander. You know, he, he had followed God. God had helped them take over some cities. Their, their, their war was going well. But then we get into Judges, and they do exactly what God warned them not to do. So we're going to start in Judges chapter 2, the, kind of the end of verse 2, going into 3. And it says, Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? And I have also said, I will not drive them out before you. They'll become traps for you, and their gods become snares to you. So this is, this is the intro. So we got the last part where Israelite came in. They didn't wipe everybody out. They started intermarrying with the people, the other seven nations. They didn't tear down the idols, the gods that all these other nations were, were worshiping. And they got sucked into it. They started to not pay attention to God that much. In the book of Judges, the entire book is this entire cycle that the group of the nation of Israel goes through over and over and over again. The first step in this cycle is they turn away from God. It's the first step. That's what we just kind of read about. The second one is they, they have suffering. God, God gives them over to a nation. The nation rules over them. They actually become slaves. Third cycle is they, they ask for God. They realize how much suffering and pain they're going through, and they ask God for help. They said, God, why, why won't you help us? Can't you help us like you did before? And God comes through. He remembers his promise with them, and he sends a judge. We have lots of cool stories about judges. We have um, Gideon, uh, Deborah, Samson is probably the mess, biggest one you guys would think of as far as the name from the judges. But the judge would come in. They'd have this huge um, battle and conflict, and they would kind of take over. And they'd have a period of peace where God would reign again and give them peace um, over their suffering. But over and over again, it's, it's that cycle. It's a never-ending cycle. So as an example, we'll kind of read through. So the first one is turn, turning away from God. So we're going to go to Judges chapter 2, 11 through 13. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. So the Baals were kind of the, the gods of the nation of Canaan, right? So that's who, who they were worshiping. And they forsook God, the God of their ancestors, ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. That should sound pretty familiar. Because if you go back to Deuteronomy, that's exactly what God said, don't do this. This is what happen, will happen to you if you do this. When we go to Judge, that's exactly what they did. We go into the suffering period. Judges, chapter 2, 14 through 15. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them in the hands of the raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them. Just as he had sworn to them, they were in great distress. Next phase is is supplication. People would cry out to God, and they'd ask him for help. 
And the final phase is actual salvation. That's when God would send a judge. Judges uh, 2, verse 18. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. This is, so this is the entire book. This is the, the book of Judges. Quick summary. Turn away from God. They suffer for it. They ask God for help. They receive help. And they have salvation. <coughs> so my question is, this whole story of this cycle, do you ever feel like that describes your life? Do you ever feel like your life is this exact same cycle? You experience God. You have that salvation. But then for some reason or another, you decide to turn your back on him. You go back to your old habits. You suffer. You ask God for help. You receive salvation. And it all starts over and over again. I think the most typical story I hear, I think, from an application from you guys as students, as a leader, is Ignite. I think the majority of you guys go to Ignite. But every year I hear you guys tell some story of how awesome Ignite is. How you experienced God, how, how cool it was. Right? That's the salvation piece, right? But months go by, maybe weeks, days, maybe even hours from getting off the bus. You're back to your old habits. You go straight back into turning your back on him. You forget what he did. And you go back into a period of suffering. The year rolls around. We're in January. And you're like, oh man, life sucks. I hate school. Life is just bull. I wish I could be back at camp. I wish God would do something cool this year at camp. I wish I could always be at camp. God, do something cool at camp this year. I'm going to go to camp this year. Supplication. You're asking God for help. You want to experience it again. July, June rolls around. We go back to camp. Full cycle goes over again. Maybe it's even a quicker cycle. Maybe it's a weekly cycle. Maybe you come to church on Sunday and say, oh, worship was awesome. Oh, that message was good. I needed to hear that. That was great. Go back to school on Monday. Hang out with your friends. over and over again. Same thing the Israelites experienced. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to say this like I'm like standing up yelling down at you guys. I'm just trying to apply it. Because it's still, it's me too. We all have the mountains and the valleys that we go through and it is this cycle. So the question is, how do we break the cycle? How do we get out of this? And so the theme kind of for today is to never forget. And I have kind of three points for you guys of what you should work on to never forget so you can stay out of this. Or if you are in it, how to break out of it. Right? Does that make sense? So the first one is never forget God's promise. 
Deuteronomy 31, 7. It says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. How comforting is that? To know that no matter what you do, whatever, no matter where you are going, God will be with you. Take a second and put yourself in the shoes of an Israelite. Standing in the middle of a desert. They've been wandering around in a desert for 40-some years. Live in a tent. They don't have a home. And they know that they're supposed to go over there and live in this really cool place, but it's filled with people that they're supposed to go to war with. And those people have more people than you have. They have better armies, better technology. But they know that God told them to do it. It's no different than your guys' lives, my life. God has a plan for your life to do something. He's put something on your heart. It's not an easy task. Going to war isn't easy. But he says, I will always be with you. Be strong and courageous. Never be afraid. Never forget that he is with you. So the second point is never forget God's command. So talk a little bit about, you know, the fact that God had commanded them to go into this land to, to wipe the nations out, to burn down their idols, <coughs> to purge the land. So why did he tell them to do that? Do you just not like those people? He told them to purge the land because God had called them to be holy. You've probably heard that before. God has called us as believers to be holy. We talk about holy means to be set apart, to be different from the world, right? God knew that if they didn't go into that land and purge the land, they would be tempted. If you don't remove the worldly things from your life, you're going to be tempted to be in the world. If you don't, this is a drastic example, but it's exactly what happened in the Old Testament. If you don't remove your neighbor who's doing all this worldly stuff, worshiping Baal, you're going to want to do it. You're going to be tempted to walk away from me. I said, so get rid of it. All of it. This is the hardest bullet point to do. Period. It's the hardest one. So what does, it, what does it mean for us? It means maybe reevaluating our friendships. Who do we hang out with? That's not a good example. That you know when you hang out with that person or that group of people that you're going to do stuff that doesn't glorify God. You're going to say stuff you shouldn't. You're going to watch stuff you shouldn't. You're going to make fun of other people that you shouldn't be. You're not going to love others. So you say, okay, should I purge myself of that relationship? Oh. What about the movies you watch? 
What about the TV shows you watch? The music you listen to? That's tough. I love my TV shows. I, guarantee, I tell you now, they're not appropriate. I like music. I love music. I love... I'm proud of my music. A lot of it's junk. Does it tempt me? Does it, it changes my thought process, right? If you guys think back of my last time I was up here, I talked about your mind. It's the same thing. It's the same message. What's in your life that affects the way you think? That's the hardest one. Once again, never forget God's command. His command is to be holy, to be different. How can you be different if you do everything that your non-Christian friend does? Not really that different, are you? The final thing, this is the most important one that I want you guys to remember. Never forget God's work. Never forget the amazing thing that God's done in your life. Never forget camp. Never forget Guatemala. Never forget what it feels like to worship him, to be up here on a Sunday or at a prayer night and experience God. Never forget what that is like. Easier said than done, though, right? Judges chapter 2, verse 10 This is going back to that beginning when the Israelites are getting ready to kind of start their campaign again. It says, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. They forgot. Do you guys forget? So the Israelites, they forgot about the wall of Jericho. They forgot about the man in the desert. They forgot about the Red Sea. They forgot about the plagues. Everything that God had done for them. How do you forget something like that? The key, I think, to this, in my opinion, is you have to make it personal. So when I was your guys' age, when I first kind of read through the Old Testament, I thought Israel was the dumbest group of people I've ever heard of. You guys are idiots, I thought. I was like, if I had been around back then, I would have never forgot about the Red Sea. Water on both sides, walking across the river on dry land. There's no way. If I saw that with my own two eyes, I would have never forgotten. I would have never turned my back on God. But they did. If I saw the walls of Jericho tumble to the ground, never. Always followed him. But they did. But you think about it also, the story of here in Judges, too, is probably about, looking at that timeline, they're probably about one to two generations removed from when these actual miracles happened. So I want you to think about it. Can you guys tell me, and this is a rhetorical question, but I want you to think about it. Can you tell me a time in your parents' life or your grandparents' life where God impacted them. Think back. Can you tell me a specific scenario or story or time in your parents' life or your grandparents' life that God impacted their life, did something incredible? 
worked a miracle. Can you do it? It's difficult for me. I'd have to think pretty hard about it. And this is where I think we as a church, not just evil, but the church as a whole, a body of believers, have failed each other. We do a terrible job of telling each other our stories. You as students should never stop talking about what happened at Ignite each year. You should never stop talking about what happened at Guatemala, what you experienced there. You should never stop talking about what God does to you on a weekly basis. You should be having conversations with your friends. What is God doing in your life right now? Because he is. If you pay attention, you have to make it personal. You should never stop telling our story. We should never stop telling each other how God is shaping our story. And so the example I want to kind of share with you guys is one of personal kind of testimony, but this is this is more Hannah's story than mine, but I'm going to share it with you guys, of, of her parents. And I think she shared a little bit about her, her testimony of how she came to faith, but a little bit more background of, of her parents. And specifically, this ties into our adoption. And this is how we want to continue to tell our story to tell the story of how God has worked in our life through our adoption. I think, you know, most of you guys are familiar, you guys have been up here before when I've talked of um, the adoption process and that, the journey that we've been going through and the way God has protected us and guided us through that. But the, the biggest update probably, I can't even remember the last time I talked to you guys what, what the news was, but the, the quick update on this for you guys is... We're matched. We're having a baby girl. It is, it, she is due in end of March. And her name will be Raleigh. That's the significant part. Here. Her name will be Raleigh Jane. You say, why Raleigh? And here's the story of Raleigh. Raleigh is a family name on Hannah's side. Raleigh um, was actually her older brother that passed away when he was six to eight months old. Okay. But the reason that's, that name is significant, and the reason we want to pass this name on to our daughter, is because it had a significant impact in her parents' life. Her parents met in high school. They, were, um, they dated through high school. And I think by the time they, when they went to college, they were 19, her, her mom got pregnant. Got pregnant with Hannah's oldest sister, who's six years older than her. They were not Christians. They did not follow God at all. And since she was pregnant, they decided to get married. And they thought, you know, hey, we're together. We're in a relationship. This is what we should do. A few years went down, went by, and things were rough. If you can imagine being 19, being married with a kid, Trying to go to college would be difficult. They were on the verge of divorce. They wanted, they wanted it to split. They said, we can't do it. I can't do it anymore. And they found out that they were pregnant again. Pregnant with a little boy. He came into the world, named him Raleigh. And six months down the road, he just died in her arms. They were at a leave a family function for a holiday. It was around Christmas, actually. She was holding him, and he just, he just died. He had a heart defect that they, they never caught. Just utterly destroyed them. They were devastated. A 
through that process, her dad had just kind of started working at UPS. He had met a colleague there who was a Christian and had started kind of witnessing to him. And through kind of the, the pain of, uh, of losing a son, her dad was finally kind of open to hearing, what is this story of hope that you have? The guy handed him a tract, his little gospel tracts. He read it, he accepted Christ. Three, four months down the road, he brought Hannah's mom to Christ. Three years later, Hannah was born. And growing up, Hannah always heard the story of who her older brother was. Of how, if that never happened, her parents probably would have never come to know Christ. How that impacted their life, completely changed the trajectory of their life. Hannah grew up knowing Christ because her parents would always tell her the story of Raleigh, of what God did in their lives, how he completely drastically changed their life. It was, per- it was personal. And we're going to pass that story on to another generation. We're going to tell her about her grandparents, about how they came to New Christ, why she was named Raleigh. The whole point of the story is you have to make it personal. If God's work is nothing but a bunch of stories in the Old Testament... You'll never remember them in, the time, in your time of need. What does it mean to you? What has God done in your life? What has God done in your friend's life? What has God done in your parents' life? To constantly remind each other, right? So as a quick summary talked about this cycle, right? The cycle of being in a constant state of deja vu. You go through life and you're like, why do I feel this way again? I'm stuck here again. It's a constant cycle. And the thing to help here is to never forget. Never forget God's promise to always be with us. It's not easy to follow out his commands. It's not easy to remember things. It's not easy to purge things from our life. But he'll always be there, leading us along. Never forget God's command. His command is to be holy, to be different. Tying back into kind of Ian's message last week of God has a purpose for you, right? Lastly, God, never forget that God works in our lives. Never forget what he's doing. Even the small stuff. It doesn't have to be crossing a Red Sea. We'll close in prayer. Lord, I just want to thank you for this message, this reminder to never forget. Um, God, thank you for uh, just being able to share uh, our stories, to be able to share who you are, um, how you're always working in our lives. Lord, be with the students this week as they go out into the world, as they go back to their lives and go back to their weekly routines. But Lord, just help them to never forget. Help them to not get stuck in this cycle. 
Lord, we thank you for your promises to always be with us. Uh, and we, we just, we thank you for that. We uh, ask your blessing on the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, amen.